Yeah, really the last hundred years have been a story of resistance on the part of incumbents, uh, largely entertainment companies, uh, who, in their response to new technologies. Um, you've seen literally since the turn of the 20th century with the creation of the player piano, uh, over and over again, new technologies creating new media opportunities that disrupt existing businesses being resisted very powerfully by those incumbents. So you can start with the player piano, which was really the Napster of 1906, if you will. It really made life very difficult for what was then the music industry, which was sheet music. Uh, songwriters who sold sheet music largely to the public. Uh, after that, of course, there was the LP record also, it's sort of part of that same story, and then broadcast radio, which was also met with a great deal of consternation by the songwriters and music publishers of the day. Uh, cable television in the 70s was viewed really as a pirate medium. All the television networks felt that taking their content and putting it on cables that ran to people's houses was piracy, pure and simple. Huge amount of litigation around that. The VCR, famous, another famous example where when the VCR was first introduced by Sony in the mid-1970s, there were lawsuits immediately brought by the movie studios who felt, in fact, who said publicly that the VCR was to the American movie industry what the Boston Strangler was to a woman alone. Uh, so, and then after that, of course, we've seen additional examples, the first MP3 player uh, by Diamond Rio, sort of the initial company long before the iPod. They were met with a lawsuit. Uh, digital audio tape recorders that were introduced in the late 80s, early 90s also sued uh, initially. And of course, most recently, peer-to-peer -peer file sharing software, lawsuit, many lawsuits filed there. The new uh, XM radio recordable, uh, sort of take your satellite radio with you, that technology has been sued. Um, so really, we see a litany of resistance. Really, resistance is the kind of hallmark of the incumbent media industry's response to new technology. Ironically, it's those new technologies which ultimately have enriched those very industries. To take the VCR for an example, the technology that was called the Boston Strangler for the movie industry turned out to be their biggest money maker in history. Uh, and throughout the 80s, 90s, and even to this day, home video, the market unlocked by the VCR, has become the biggest revenue uh, producer for the whole business. Well, the legislative process in the United States surrounding copyright law has had one recurring problem, and that is that the laws tend to be made by lobbyists for lobbyists. And so the question is, who affords, who can pay the lobbyists and the lawyers to go and push Congress year in and year out for new copyright laws? Well, for the most part, those lobbyists have been employed by the entertainment industries. They're the ones who have the money and the interest to push in Washington for copyright laws. And so it's no surprise that the laws that get passed are largely laws that are written by those lobbyists in the interests of major media companies of the day. Um, to the extent there's been resistance, the resistance has really been in the form uh, of lobbyists hired by the technology sector. Uh, and that's a good thing, frankly, for innovation and a good thing in the long run for consumers. Um, but it's obviously not a perfect solution because technology companies, their interests aren't always precisely aligned with consumers. Um, so over the past 15 or so odd years, we've seen lots of legislation, some of which has been passed, all of which has really pushed for more copyright, more uh, longer term, more protections. Uh, with very few exceptions, the ratchet has been a one-way ratchet. So another example of legislation that has been a part of the one-way ratchet uh, for more copyright has been the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, um, which basically gave copyright owners the ability to put restrictions, technical restrictions on their works, what many people call DRM. Uh, and if they've done so, they then really get to dictate the terms uh, on which you're allowed to use the work. That's a DRM faces some fundamental problems. It's never going to work at stopping digital copying. Uh, and the basic problem was laid out in a paper that's come to be known as the Darknet paper that was written by four senior Microsoft security engineers back in 2002. And they started from a few premises. They said, first of all, DRM is always going to be broken by someone. There is no DRM system that's been created that's proof against the efforts of a PhD in computer science. 
Uh, and that's, it, it's never going to be. Uh, and we've seen that time and time again, DRM systems are introduced and they are broken. Uh, and you know, the, the other point they make is when it comes to media content, like popular movies, there will always be a motivation to break it. Uh, so it's not to say that we can't use DRM to protect your medical records, for example, uh, or you know, your family photo album. Uh, perhaps you know, th there's a lack of motivation there for anyone to try to break that. But when we're talking about the latest Spider-Man movie, there's no shortage of motivation around the world for smart computer hackers to try to crack the DRM. And so far, and I think for the foreseeable future, that's going to continue to mean that these systems get broken. It's impossible to build a foolproof system, and all the computer security experts agree on that. So the second uh, insight and premises uh, of the darknet argument is that once a copy has been taken out of its secure envelope, once some hacker has broken it, uh, at that point, those copies will be made available uh, through other channels. Uh, in other words, we have today the ability to make copies and distribute copies inexpensively. And of course, we've seen that time and time again since Napster. It's very easy. If one copy leaks out on the internet, very rapidly it's available to everyone. And the thing to keep in mind there is when the person downloads a movie from a BitTorrent site or from uh, a LimeWire or from some other peer-to-peer uh, -peer file sharing network, or if the person gets it in a copy from a, a friend on a blank CD or a blank DVD, there's no need for that person to break the DRM, right? The DRM is gone. Only the first person in the chain needs to be able to break the DRM, and once one person has extracted the content from the secure, quote unquote, secure envelope, from that point forward, the content is freely accessible to anyone who's able to run a file sharing tool, make a copy on a hard drive, uh, you know, anybody, and, and of course, many millions of people are in that position. So as long as we live in that environment, an environment where DRM can be broken by someone somewhere, and a world where all of us are connected by channels that allow us to make and distribute copies inexpensively, DRM is really in a hopeless quandary. There is no way DRM is ever going to be able to make progress against uh, the ability to make unauthorized digital copies. Uh, it's simply a, a tool that's ill-suited to that particular purpose. Uh, and we've seen this time and time again. You look at DVDs, obviously DVD encryption was broken. All the movies that are released on DVD are now widely available through unauthorized sources on the internet. Uh, the same has been true of CD copy protection. That has been an utter failure at stopping the distribution of unauthorized music. Even the new Blu-ray and high-def HD DVD formats, their uh, DRM has been completely and utterly compromised as well. Literally every movie that's released in these high-def formats is going up on unauthorized BitTorrent sites uh, on a daily basis. Uh, so it seems quite clear that DRM is never going to stop or even impede uh, the unauthorized copying. And in fact, the Microsoft engineers went one step further and said not only is it not do any good, but it actually harms copyright owners because DRM ends up making the legitimate product, the authorized product, less attractive than the unauthorized product. Right? Because for the consumer that goes out and buys the DRM encrypted copies, actually lays out the money to purchase it, they find that the copy they purchased is less useful.